Okay, so we're live. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Who are you? I'm David Lee. <laughs> <laughs> cool, I'm a kiki. Um, why don't we talk about why we're here, who we are, what we're doing? Why we, uh, I'm here. Do you want me to talk about why I'm here yes, first? Yes, please. Um, okay, so, yeah, for sure. I'm Makiki. I was um, asked by Max to uh, come and do some trainings and have some conversations about um, PNP or chemsex or party to play. And um, it's uh, a part of our community as uh, gay, bi, queer, and other men who have sex with men. Uh, and it's a part of my community as someone that participates in the PNP party scene, chemsex scene. Um, and yeah, I thought it was really important. And then I got to meet you via, was it Skype? Yes, yeah, yeah. Skype, yeah. And, uh, and we had a little bit of a conversation, but you have a role here at Max too. Yes, I'm actually um, on the advisory board awesome. for um, PNP. And the reason why I got involved in it is because of the fact that I party myself. And I learned a lot of information, and I think information is so valuable to the scene. And this is one of my main reasons, is to get information out there to protect people and have them do things the right way and not be in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons, that's the main reasons why I, I do what I do. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for um, asking me. I have been uh, also involved in a bunch of different capacities with different organizations, like what was the Crystal Meth Coalition for a long time. I did harm reduction work in Toronto in a bunch of different agencies and capacities. Um, but I've also been taking drugs for... How old am I allowed to say? How old am I? I've been taking drugs for most of the time that I have been alive. Um, and uh, there is a lot of negative attitudes and negative approaches specifically around guys that take drugs while we have sex. Have you experienced that too? Yes, I have, big time. Ugh, it's so... It's... Bye, Felicia. Yeah. And even online, it's sometimes it's bad. You know, you get comments and people, like, will delete you right away or block your profile or actually even send a report and then you're blocked from the website right. itself. It's wild because we were just talking earlier and you were saying about how there are some drugs that are okay yeah. and some drugs that are not okay. Like some drugs were even celebrated for taking. Like ecstasy. Um, I was using, I've been using ecstasy. Well, I started using when I was 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like seen as like an okay gay drug. It's yes. like, I only party on my birthday, uh, New Year's, and Pride. Yeah. You know, and like ecstasy is seen as like an acceptable gay drug in that way. And similarly, like alcohol is also seen as like, it's how we mark all of our social occasions. But other drugs have a lot more stigma. And, you know, like the, the there's one drug in particular. Hi, Tina. Um, that <laughs> that has been referred to as like the scourge of the gay community and it's destroying our communities. And just like to put my worker hat on for a minute, even though I'm not officially a worker anymore, but like as a concerned community member and, you know, full-time partier, um, I actually think that it's more important for us to figure out why are the, what are the other things that are going on in our lives um, that that are putting us in a situation where we need to shut down or where we need to disconnect or like why is it that uh, we become like vulnerable to drug dependence it's not because a drug is evil drugs don't have feelings or intentions about being good or bad there's other things that go on in our lives and i think that like homophobia and the war on drugs and all of that negativity all of those things are things that kind of contribute but we'll get into that um, I was going to say too, that's the main reason why I ended, I ended up starting drugs was because I was, up, I was ostracized in school, I, was also, I, was, I had buck teeth, I, was, uh, I had ear issues, I had speech therapy, I had everything. The kids, you, when you're a teenager, do not put people down. Yeah, please. Don't put them down, because that's how I ended up starting usage of drugs. Yeah. Yeah, it can be like a really um, useful way to like 
shut down, to distance, to compartmentalize. I mean, there's like a million reasons why now I want to use drugs. Um, but when I first started, a lot of it was just because I wanted to, um, I mean, in my head when I first started, I wanted to like explore other like relationships to reality and wanted to see like what were some different like ways that my body could feel. And it really was like about exploration. And now as I've grown up, um, Oh, that's interesting to think of myself as grown up. Um, but now that I have spent time like doing drugs and reflecting on what that has meant to me, um, I've also recognized that I've used them in similar ways to like to cope with with stress or negative emotions, uh, to help me regulate emotions that feel too complicated, uh, but also just for celebration. Yes. And also because they can feel really good. Yes, they can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think what we were thinking about for kind of structuring this conversation um, is we're doing this as like a live AMA. So hi everybody, we're really excited you can join. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be taking questions from you all um, that you know come about during the recording. So feel free to uh, you know type something in and ask us what you want. So it's essentially we're doing like an AMA or like ask me anything um, in the context of uh, Chemsex or PNP. Um, but we're also going to talk a little bit about some strategies that we've come up with, things that work for us. And again, I think it's just important that we say, if we're talking about something that works for us, um, it may not work for you. And the best way to figure out if something is going to work for you is to, you know, do some more research and, and check it out. Or try it. Or try it. Or try it. Um, so we're going to do a little bit about like how we prep for a party scene or PNP event, a chem sex session, uh, what happens during, what are some things that we can kind of be aware of, also some harm reduction wise practices, kind of stuff like that, and then some uh, good old aftercare. Yes, yeah. which is important. So when we're thinking about like setting up a scene, what are some of the things that you think uh, have been important for you or work well for you? What has worked well for me is I'm honest and direct with people right away. So you say, like, I want a party. I want, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I put it out there. I put, I'm this, this, this. And I like, and I also party. Yeah. Do you party also? Do you P&P? Yes or no? And a lot of people will say yes. Yeah. And I also will tell them, I will mention that it's a stress-free household. No, no uh, issues come into the house. Mm -hmm. Any issues coming to the house? I mean, I would love it if I could leave my issues at the door, but it's... No, but... <laughs> I, I mean, that if, it bring, if you bring problems in, it can end up into bigger problems. Absolutely. That's where I don't allow that to happen in my house. Yeah. I actually, and even at nighttime, I tell people, listen, if you're going to disturb my neighbors or anybody, you're out the door because I don't want the cops at my door. I don't want my neighbors complaining. Yeah. I'm very conscious of, conscientious of my neighbors and all my neighbors know that. Well, I think good partiers make good neighbors. Yes, yeah. they do. <laughs> <laughs> they sure do. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things in, in prepping. And I, I like being able to be honest and say, this is what I'm interested in and I want to party. You know, is like, is this the right fit for you? Because surprising someone with a party scene, not usually gonna go the way that we want. Yeah, similar to like hooking up is just hooking up and using apps and being online is just a complicated way of trying to get our sexual needs met and to build community and to form intimacy. Um, but we find a way to do it anyway. And as awkward as it is, and as much stigma as there is around a bunch of things in queer reality, um, drug use is another one of those things that that sometimes the anonymity that comes along with apps can be like, okay, well, you're not into it. Yeah. See you, girl. Exactly. Yeah. So that can actually be uh, a useful thing for people to um, not have uh, not have to build an emotional connection with someone before they disclose this thing that can be really stigmatizing. And also not having expectations on what is going to happen. Yeah. That's one of the biggest, my, one of my biggest pet peeves is when somebody tells me I want, you did, I want this done, this done, this done. 
I'm sorry. That's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can we get open the door on a white unicorn, and then I want you to float me onto the bed with 17 giant vibrating gongs, and... No. No. No, it, no it's not going to happen. I, and, I, and I just... Uh, if somebody demands me to do something? No, I'm not going to do it. Oh, absolutely not. No. And I, I don't get any... Well, mine goes right down and sort of demands me, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that because I like, get more pressure on me. Totally. I, I, I met some people that were... One person was... Oh, she was, he was a beautiful, beautiful guy. I hope you're watching. And, and he kept saying to me, I want you to fuck me, I want you to fuck me, I want you to fuck me. And I'm saying to him, and I'm like, I had to... Call, I have to tell his partner, I can't play with you guys anymore because he's putting too much pressure on me. Yeah. And one issue that I have is that there's too many darn bottoms and not enough versatile people. Call the bottom registry. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a surplus. And, and when you're versatile, you end up doing the fucking more than you end up having getting fucked yourself. Honey, that's what toys are for. I don't like toys. Though. Well, okay, then we're gonna have to have a whole other. <laughs> but I think like that. So that's I think a really good point though is if we can go in with the idea that these are some things that I'm interested in, these are some things that I'm not interested in. Let's kind of see what what kind of beautiful adventure is gonna happen when I figure out what my chemistry is with this person or this room full of people. Um, and, you know, or this building for people. <laughs> uh, then that uh, doesn't set us up for disappointment exactly. as opposed to going in and being like, I demand that you do this one thing. Also, we have bodies, and I don't know if anybody out there who's watching has, also has a body, but you may realize that they don't always do what you want them to <laughs> no, no. And as you get older, it doesn't always happen either. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, as they say in France, Take a chill pill. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we talked about when we're like setting up a party is like, what about if this is, you know, like a party that's already happened? You got a couple of your friends over, your f handsome friend who you want to keep partying with has invited someone else over. He's like, oh, I don't want you to share my photo to like someone that you're chatting with who wants to come over. So, like, I want to go to this space. I've invited someone says, oh, there's four guys here. We're all partying. I want, I want to know who's in this room. But what happens when someone uh, doesn't want to share that? I think that this, I don't, like, I don't have an answer, to be honest. I don't either. I don't. Um, I just, what I, for me, I let people, uh, my pictures out there, so I don't care. Um, and, I, and that's the attitude that I have, is that I don't really care what other people say because I, they don't really know me. Yeah. The people that really get to know me, really get to know me. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones that keep coming back, and they're the ones that keep, um, and that's where you and start. And you should see his repeat list because it is long, <laughs> <laughs> uh, longer than my rap sheet. <laughs> um, but I think like this this question was brought up to us earlier today, and I think it's actually a really important one to think about: is how drug use stigma, and specifically stigma around chemsex and partying, um, means that we're sometimes getting in the way of, of even doing it. Where like yes. the, the stigma gets in the way of us even being able to participate and to meet people because we're so fearful that it may be someone that I know who's gonna judge me. It's like, girl, if they are on the other end of the phone looking to come over. Exactly. <laughs> I don't think that they're gonna judge. But you never know. I've had people. Yeah, I want you to know if it's true. Yeah, I've had people that do judge. Yeah. yeah. It's tricky in the moment. It is, it's so tricky, especially in the, especially with uh, especially with meth. It's it's very tricky. Yeah. You know, meth has been viewed very badly. Mm -hmm. People and uh, I never did. I didn't start partying until I was eighteen. No, twenty one years old. Mm -hmm. And anybody that part, anybody that, did, that smoked a J, they weren't my friends in school. Okay. I and remember that. That house. That's how bad, that's how, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, and I just, and then I just tried it once and I, I got to, the, I got bugged so many times and ostracized so many times that mm -hmm. I said, you know what, screw it. I'm going to try FCC and I tried it and I loved it. Because well, it makes, like, it, it, it literally, literally makes you feel like uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you can make that noise again if you need to. <laughs> I just love ecstasy. I mean, I, I just wish that they would, they went to, I had one pill, $50, but you were fucked up for 20 hours. <laughs> oh my God, it was just wonderful. One pill, it was just like, that's all you needed at that time, when it first came out. Yeah, so now, a different story. Yes. Um, just a couple of other things to kind of add in to, before we move on to like, some strategies for like, while we're in the, in the scene. Um, one of the things that we were thinking about is like, um, uh, what's the word that we were thinking? Um, just like kind of safety planning, like what happens if, um, you know, things don't go well. Like I would like for my friend to know that I've gone to this, you know, person's house or whatever. There's a bunch of different reasons why we might want someone that we care about or someone that is close to us, um, to know that we have like planned a bit of a like extended adventure um, and then letting our friends know can also be like a tricky thing like yes yeah I think exactly. I really appreciate that you are so open I'm very uh, I'm super open yeah I can't believe how super open I am <laughs> <laughs> everybody knows my life um, but but that's how I but that's how I stay safe is because I've taken different pieces of information from people yeah and one, one rule of thumb that I always use in my house when I party is if I see something that is not right, I will not mention it to that person at that present time. I will wait till the party is done and then I will mention it to them at, at, a, at a decent time. Because I have witnessed where people have gone from, have flipped so fast. Which, and it can actually end up being a more dangerous situation. Mm -hmm than it is if you're not, if you're confronting them right now, especially in partying. Yeah, it, it can escalate, it can escalate. Ways, and it's really difficult, especially if we're on stimulants, exactly. to try and keep a situation, especially if you're bringing up um, a situation where someone's done something that you don't approve of, or that you think like is worth checking in with or challenging, then with like adding stimulants to that situation, it's really hard to actually keep it even keel. Yes. Um, so, being open with at least like one person, finding someone in our life, it could also even just be a party buddy. Like it doesn't have to be like a bestie, but it could be someone that you trust to talk about stuff that's going on in your party life and just letting them know, hey, I'm going to do this thing, you know, like check in with me in a day or so. And uh, you know, like I'll either invite you along or say, and party was dead, or say, you know, had a great time, was there for a bunch of hours met some cool people, or didn't, or whatever. But mo most of the time, I like to party at my place. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I have a better control on the situation yeah. than if I was at somebody else's house. Um, especially uh, here, the bus system is not the best at late at night, mm -hmm. so it's hard to get around the mm -hmm. times. And I don't have a lot of cash to spend on taxis or Uber, Uber or that. I get, I'm the one that ends up getting asked, can you yeah. pay for my Uber and you're 1.5 kilometers away? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, um, no. it's funny because I prefer to travel instead of host mm. because I like not having to worry about my stuff. I know that my place is my, um, nest yeah. when I come back to it and it's set up in a way where I know that I'm going to be able to come home and I've got all of the food that I have bought specifically for me to come down, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, and all of the things that I'm going to need for me to take care of myself are going to be there and I don't have to worry. Also because I tend to be a bit of a people pleaser and it can be sometimes difficult to say, I'm exhausted, this party needed to end an hour ago, but y'all are still having fun and I don't want to rain on the parade. I think that that's like that asserting, being able to assert those boundaries and recognize that just because someone's having fun in the room doesn't mean that your sleep needs to suffer as a result, you know? And actually, myself, I actually, um, people in my place, they, I let them come in and go when they want. Yeah. So I don't have a time limit. Um, I just say, as long as you keep things cool and collective, yeah. I don't care. You can stay here all day, all night. You can stay two days, two nights. I don't care. That's great. As long as you're yeah. taking care of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep yourself And I also, and one good trick 
especially if you're HIV positive. One thing that I have learned is to never forget your medications. And the way I've learned to do that is by having a calendar in my kitchen and saying, MT, med taken. Yeah. Oh, miss. And I know I took my med that day. That's great. And that is a useful tool. Thank you. And that's that. These are the things that I often use because I missed twice when I was in Toronto and I was mad at myself. Yeah. And I said, ah, okay, my calendar's there, but why don't I just put MT on the calendar? Yeah. yeah. And that's great. I also uh, want to make sure that when I'm going on a bit of a like party bender, par I party. I tend to call it a party melt. Um, <laughs> like it's like tuna melt, but with you know drugs. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right? Uh, but I always take um, one to two days extra of meds with me. It's like yes. I think I'm gonna be gone for a day. I'll take like three days of meds, just in case you know that someone there really catches my eye. Yeah. Um, and, and just, you know, like, to be on the safe side. Um, and similarly, I will also kind of think about, like, what my budget is. Mm -hmm. You know? I don't know about our viewers, but I am uh, not attractive enough to get my drugs for free. <laughs> so um, I have to think about, like, what is, what is, like, the amount that I'm interested in taking? And then how, like, what is my budget for this particular event? And... Uh, you know, I know some people that like freeze their credit cards, like put them in like a block of ice so it takes the amount of time to like melt the ice so they can get their cards back and stuff. I don't quite go that far. Um, but I will often like leave a bank card at home and take the amount of money plus maybe 20 or $50 on top of that because I like treat myself. <laughs> um, so that I, you know, so that I know what I'm willing to kind of outlaw, outlay um, and then I'm not gonna be also feeling bad the next week because not only do I feel bad because I don't have the same level of like serotonin mm -hmm. flowing through my brain but also because I've gone over budget so I try to alleviate that as well and my mine is um, I actually I'm the one that mostly shares nice well that's very it's, generous of you and very nice for your friends <laughs> yes but there's also a limit I also have my limits though okay. too and one of my limits is that I like I had one person that shared with me two days ago, so I said to him at the end of the month I will get you back, and that and I always I always try and make that as a priority. Yeah. And people love me for that because, but then if you take advantage of me, don't think I'm not stupid mm -hmm. because I do catch it. And that's one thing that I always will try, I will do actually, is make sure that you're not taking advantage of me. If you are, then you're, you're gone. Well, I, I think that, like, it's, I'm interested in thinking about, um, like, how we can move past, uh, like, an economic model, like a capitalist economic model in the bedroom of thinking about, like, how we can work from, like, a gift economy and where it's just about, like, sharing with no expectation of return. Exactly. And at the same time, Everything is sex work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could get into some strategies for like what we actually are doing in the, in the moment. Like what some of the the things that um, that people have asked us about, and some of it was some like practical strategies um, for like what's a booty bump. Um, David, do you want to? Booty bump is the booty us away. Um, you actually put. Um, you put a little bit of tea, um, Tina, in either, um, what do we call, um, uh, yeah, there's also, no, those are the other yeah. So what is this that we're taking apart? Oh, look, it's Let's a safer booty bumping bump kit. kit from Max. You can get this at Max Ottawa. <laughs> and the way we and actually this is one of the best I've actually seen I know that's great it is actually fantastic and what, what is it exactly this is a booty bump kit so what you do is you take you put it you take your sterile uh, and this device is actually like a, it's a, a tipless syringe like syringe. a needleless syringe oh that water is so good and definitely not vodka <laughs> 
Actually, I wish it was vodka. <laughs> <laughs> palm oil. No, not palm oil. What did I mean? Um, um, not palm oil. Which one of these do we have? All of the other ones. Yes, all the other ones. Just have, I love my notes. So essentially, a tipless syringe, or like one of those um, cute, like, turkey basting, but more medicalized. For those that have a medical fetish, really, really up your alley. And, and actually, you can use this as, a, as, as putting the tea in there too and making sure that the water is, you have to make sure that the tea is all dissolved. And, but I use the hot water for... So there were a bunch of different strategies that we heard about uh, uh, with like some people say that you grind the tea or some people they grind it um, for others using hot water. I make it up uh, and then hand it to whoever's in the room uh, who's going to be using it. Um, and then uh, get them to shake it because uh, Tina's water soluble. So just you know, put your bottoms to work yep. or tops to work, however, <laughs> uh, and get people to like spend that time, which you can spend doing other things, you know, like flower arrangement. Yes, exactly. And the good thing about this is that you can. What I do is you take. Um, I put mine in the. I put mine in the top here, mm -hmm. and then I just no. How did I do mine this way? Put my top, tops, bottoms, who's to say? Yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how I did mine that last night. Um, put it like that. No. So you can't, make, you can't let it go out, that's for sure, and you'll lose all your teeth. So the best way to do it, yes, yeah, that's the best way of doing it. And and it really works, and it goes in so easy. Put glass, you know, you put um, um, lube on it. You put some lube on it, and it will. It goes in so easy. It's incredible. So where do you put the lube? On on the device. On the device. So this is salt that you may have seen me just take out of this salt shaker. So chill out, community standards. <laughs> and. What you didn't see, because I don't have a, uh, a baking scale, is that I'm not eyeballing this, because that would mean that I don't know how much I'm putting in. In fact, I'm going to weigh this. I've seen a bunch of different ways for people to figure out dosing. Um, and people have, like, we've had a bunch of people ask, um, you know, like, what's the proper dose? And the proper dose is the dose that works for you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the only way to find that out is trial and error. And the way that you have less error is when you start small. So upping your dose is always easier than dealing with a bad trip and coming down. Um, so weigh the amount that we're going to put in, add it in, and then this is uh, sterile water or injection water that you can get from a harm reduction room, or it's a booty bucket kit from Max Um So we've added the chemical and essentially, because you don't, you can't press this really down that easy. Oh, well, it's actually not that hard. Yeah. I'm gonna shake and bake, and I helped. And, then and essentially, you're gonna keep that going until it's all dissolved. Exactly. And then I'll hand it to the air of that. And then what? You, and then what I do is I always put lube on it because it just makes it easier to go in. And that is when. And Where does it go? It goes right up the butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it goes, right up the butt. And um, in your experience, what position do you think is the easiest for for someone to have it up the butt? I actually just do it in on the on the back on the toilet me, myself. Oh well, you have some very good pelvic floor control. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I just do it on a, I just do it right there and that's it. And in my experience, for some of my um, uh, more pliable friends, uh, have recommended uh, on all fours uh, as the easiest way, so that they're not going to spill anything out and then like immediately like immediately lie down or clench, but to or to like make sure that their butt is up near, depending on how much work has been happening yes. back prior. Um, but essentially, uh, diluting. The, the compound or molecule or drug, um, and then uh, it's the solution that gets um, put into the butt. And then because the rectal lining is such a beautiful absorptive mucous membrane, it allows that solution to enter the bloodstream. So it can be a really, really uh, fun way for folks if it fits with your values. 
Um, what about G? Maybe we'll s uh, skip on to this next one and then do yep. G and then come back. So, um, GHB is... Um, how do you do G? So we talk about GHB or GBL. So um, they're two different compounds. I think it's actually important to, to um, disambiguate. G is not just G. Like GBL uh, is, I think, over two times the strength of GHB. Um, and the other thing is that... Um, there's always different strengths. Like the G that I had last week, uh, the guy said it was really strong, and it was for him, but it wasn't uh, the same as the stuff that I had the week before from someone else who he said, oh, it was fine, but it like knocked me on my ass. So different people have different, like different batches are made to different strengths, but we know that GBL in general is going to be stronger, require a much smaller dose than GHB. But anyway, and I've actually blacked. I've actually uh, blacked out on. Uh, I've actually blacked out on G actually. Yeah. And I actually, I me too. Had things stolen in my apartment because of it. Well, that's. I think that's actually like a really important thing to bring up. Is like when we talk about the idea of of um, overdosing. I think overdose prevention, over overdose response, isn't just oh my god, someone's dying, or I need to go to the hospital. There's also other things with, like, take going, overdosing just means that you've taken some amount that's over the dose that you wanted. Exactly. And one of the resulting things, especially to be aware of with GHB or GBL, uh, is if it's mixed with alcohol, for instance, and you don't have a high tolerance to either of those, or like a reasonable tolerance to either of those, um, it can cause you to, uh, to pass out or black out. Um, and also if you go over what we call the therapeutic window, like there's a low like threshold of what, um, what it's, when it's doing what you want it to be doing, and then when your body is like, I'm just going to lie down for a minute. <laughs> and one good word of advice, please take this advice, is do not do G without having another companion friend there. That was my biggest mistake that I made. I put myself at risk because I took GHB, I took G in the house with somebody else, and that's when I got my cell phone stolen and my my uh, computer stolen. Well, I think that's a really that's a really good point. Is um, partying with other people, especially trying out a new batch or trying out a new drug, trying the dose of a specific batch, like to, to dose the new batch, uh, or even like new dealer or whatever. Um, or if you've been off for a while, but like using with other people, especially someone that you trust, is yes. a really, really awesome strategy. We don't always have that luxury though. Um, no. So one way that I have tried to, uh, to remedy that for myself, pardon me, has been um, to like to FaceTime with a friend or like be texting in an ongoing way with a person and, you know, and let them know Thankfully, I have a bunch of people in my life that I trust and can do this with, and kind of let them know that, you know, I'm just testing something out here. Um, so if for some reason I'm not responding, you know, to just, like, tell my neighbor to go knock on my door or whatever, you know? My neighbors are usually good because if I don't come out within a day or two days, they actually will knock on my door. Oh, great. So I have good neighbors around me. That's awesome. So that's one thing that I've always, that's one thing I've always made sure when I'm in an apartment, as I got older too, when I'm in an apartment building, to make sure you know your neighbors. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. so important. Yeah. Because you never know. We're still sending the slugs. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, so then taking G, uh, is there a G kit that Max Auto provides? What? Yeah. Oh my god, and you get a G kit, and you get a G kit, and you get a G kit. <laughs> Do you want to hold any of this up to the yeah. camera? So these are the so actually so these are, right there. So these are the um, key kits right here. So it gives you a, it gives you does it give, it does have line? Yes, it gives you it, there's lines on there, so it gives you the amount of dosage that you do want. And. and the thing is that, um, so there's like, indica like indicators on this little uh, measuring device that has a, a cap that closes, which is great. Um, so there's indicators so you can know how much you're doing, and especially if you may be new to G, um, or maybe you've had some alcohol uh, and you're nervous about tolerance, you can start lower, start low, go slow. Um, but also
also you are able to, uh, to measure your doses if, say, your dose is higher or somewhere in between. It's not just, um, uh, what I've seen often in parties is like there's a bottle cap or something and people are like, oh, just like pour it, I just use a bottle cap. And while that is a strategy that we use when we don't have anything else, if there are tools available, I would really prefer it if folks were able to come and get something where they can get an accurate measurement. Because when you have like a wide basin like this, or like a bottle cap that you're measuring with, it depends on like how concave or convex the surface tension of the liquid is, and uh, specifically with measuring G, there's been, um, uh, there can be up to like a four milliliter difference in what one person considers a full cap and what someone else considers a full cap because of the, the difference in water tension on the top. And that's like, that's a pretty significant difference in dosing. Yes, and, and body size too. Yeah. Body yeah. size is most important. I'm, I'm a thin person, so it's going to hit me more faster than... You too. <laughs> but I'm going to hit me more faster than, than most people will. Yeah. So body, you know, depending on your chemistry. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I am a, like a giant octopus with most of my limbs hidden. Um, but I also, you know, like have a different relationship to... Um, uh, top like tolerance to GHB in relation to on its own versus like with other substances. Um, so I think next we'll maybe talk about slamming. That's a good one. This is the thing this is had, the one that is very controversial. Right, people have so many questions about it. I mean, um, everyone wants a revolution, but no one wants to do the dishes. So everybody has questions about slamming, but. Um, would never ask it. So when I uh, used to be a sex educator in the high school system uh, in Calgary 800 years ago, um, uh, we would sometimes just put um, questions in the question box that were uh, planted. Okay. Because we knew that this was yeah. a question that we would get that was also really highly stigmatized, mm -hmm. uh, but we thought it was really important to address. So I am just going to say that um, there's nothing, um, like, one of the concerns that I think people have about um, any sort of injection drug use uh, is uh, because there's, like, it's, it's breaking the skin. It seems like a medical procedure. Um, and, uh, you know, and unfortunately, we've seen all of the, like, the horror stories. There's, it's, we stopped doing fear-based sexual health promotion years and years and years ago. Yes. But we still do fear-based drug user ed. And this, I think, actually needs to change. I do too. Yeah. I, I've always believed in, in regulated drugs. I, I, I'm a strong, I, I, I wish that people would take, look at alcohol and look at drugs. And you see the difference. In, alcohol is legal. Drugs are not legal. But if drugs were legal, we wouldn't have so many deaths on fentanyl. Yeah, yeah. Because it's legal, you're doing it in a, you're doing it in a controlled environment. Well, and we'd be but able to manage a safe, safe supply. Safe, like, exactly. All the war on drugs is totally... It, it was, it, war on drugs was a, a flop in there. Yeah, and, and, it's, it's, and it's made the lives of so many people we care about so much harder. Exactly. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about slamming uh, or injecting or banging um, crystal meth. Um, I think that it's important to note that um, uh, injection as a practice, um, if like someone learns the best practice or wise practice on how to do it, um, then there's nothing inherently scary, unless you're scared of needles, there's nothing inherently like wrong or dangerous about this route of administration or way of taking the drug. The concern is when we learn methods that aren't necessarily um, sustainable, or that aren't like aren't a way that uh, is gonna you know manage our health in the best way, and then those practices um, can end up leading to things like abscesses or, or skin infections or soft tissue infections uh, or bloodborne infections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it's not uh, it's not that injection use in and of itself is something terrible. It's the the stigma that means that people end up having to do it 
without being able to uh, learn it properly and being able to do it in safe places. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we would then, whoa, uh, you would want to have some sort of drug, and my drug of choice today is salt. <laughs> uh, so we would want to measure out the amount that you uh, are planning on taking, and again, uh, because um, different ways of taking different drugs or different routes of administration uh, are going to uh, make you feel or impact the drug in different ways. With um, slamming or injecting, uh, eyeballing is not my preferred method to figure out what your dose is. I have seen people that like will pulverize it, people that will just put like put it in and try and measure it based on the numbers that are on the syringe. Um, but powdered or pulverized crystal is going to be a very different volume than taking um, like actual pieces and putting it in. And are you packing it down with So it's like, you know, it's a little bit more like baking. We want to actually be precise with our measurements. Um, and because this is going directly into the bloodstream, it's going to affect us in a quicker way, and it's going to be a stronger high than other ways because it bypasses all the other mucous membranes and other ways for the drug to get into our bloodstream that take our body, uh, that take time for, for the body to be like, okay, okay, girl, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, this way, it's just like, hi, I'm here. I'm sorry I didn't ring, I just saw your lights were on. Um, so again, you want to make sure that you know uh, how much you are taking. So we've already measured this out and we put it in. And I know that there are going to be some girls who are like, backloading, but um, I think actually the backloading is... I think, I think so too, actually. I think it's a wise practice for, for crystal, because we're not filtering it. I think, actually, yeah. And I just dumped liquid in the back, um, as opposed to potentially bending the syringe, bending the tip by withdrawing that way. Um, you could do it on a filter in a cooker if you want, but with a crystal kit you don't really need cookers anyway. Um, so you want to get the air all up to the top. And then so you can see like liquid bead on the top. And you want to shake it until it's all dissolved. I think it might actually have a little bit too much salt in there. But if I could get my lovely friend David to continue shaking for me. Yes you can. Keep them busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then while that's happening, I can prepare the site. So, not going to be doing a live injection, because I really do not want to inject salt into my vein. <laughs> that would be a really, really lovely way to end an illustrious life. <laughs> um, but what we are going to do is I already have done some vein mapping, so I've looked online, I have a, a map so I can figure like where on my arm are the veins that I want to look for. Um, and then when I, when I have a comfortability with that, also you can go to your harm reduction room or go to someone uh, that, you know, that works at a community health center who's involved in harm reduction work or sometimes a street outreach peer um, to give you some more information on finding a vein, on vein maintenance, um, and on how like looking after your vein and rotating sites. Like all of these are really important strategies for, uh, for um, injection drug use. So then you would want to use a tourniquet or a tie, and these ones come in the kit, and, I'm not doing a great job here, but, tie off. Normally I will, I say that I'm gonna swab first so that it has time to dry, and I never end up doing it. I always end up tying first. And you take an alcohol swab and you wipe the same direction, and don't reuse the alcohol swabs. Um, and then, while the tourniquet is still on, you would line it up with the vein, and uh, it's going to be bevel up, which is also a great documentary about drug use in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Um, but bevel up basically means um, that the tip of the syringe is cut in a way that the opening of that little metal pipe has a direction. And you want to make sure that that is up, um, because you're going to be sliding it in at a 45 degree angle down. One of the things that's important for injection specifically around Matthews, 
Here we go. Aha, and I have a great spot. Is flagging. So we really want to make sure that we are going into the vein and nowhere else. Because if we um, are injecting uh, and it goes into the soft tissue but not the actual vein, it is a way higher chance of getting an abscess or a soft tissue infection as compared to a lot of other substances. Um, so uh, when you learn from a harm reduction worker, friendly harm reduction worker, on how to safely inject, and, and they will teach you what flagging is. But essentially, because we don't have a human arm, we tried to do this on some poor, now um, very unhappy grapefruits <laughs> <laughs> to make something that would seem a little bit more like um, not a, you know, a scary cup. But basically what you're looking for is when you pull back on the tip of the syringe, you're going to see a little bit of blood enter into um, the syringe. So you'll see that right now. So sterilize, blood tourniquet on, blah, 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 and then... Let me get back in my way. Oh, you're going to hold it? No, nope, we're good. And you can see that there's a little bit of blood that comes into the barrel of the syringe. And that is not necessarily going to be that... Ooh, I just barked that right into the microphone. It's not going to necessarily be that dramatic, because we were using food coloring, and uh, food coloring in water has a very different viscosity than human blood. Um, but you definitely need to see it, because that's the only way that you can tell that uh, the tip of the syringe is actually in the vein and not in the soft tissue surrounding it. Uh, so then, again, <laughs> not to make a mess of Max's office space, but deploy the syringe. Uh, food coloring goes everywhere. Um, withdraw, I mean, take off the tourniquet, withdraw the needle. I mean, some, what am this? Is. Withdraw, take off the tourniquet, and, uh, you know, and then put like a, a cotton ball or band-aid. Um, and um, roll with it. Yeah. Just have fun. Just have fun. Yeah. And that's actually, I think that's a really good point um, to bring up, David. It's like, why are we doing this? Like, why are we taking drugs and having sex anyway? Because I love it. No. It's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. I, 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 as long as you do it safely and you keep your, the participants safe, and if you're a host, you always watch, make sure, and best, what I do if people are standing, I make sure that the needles do go back into the black container. The sharp spin. And, yeah, and you go right into there. Locked up tight. Yep. And you just, I'm just having fun. Don't expect everything. Don't expect the mountain. And you expect, I want this done, I want that done. Just go in and have fun. And I think a lot of people don't really have, they don't really get to enjoy it because they're not, they want, the expectations are always there. Yeah. And that's one thing that I find is, uh, it's sort of sad to see sometimes. Well, I think it's also useful for us to like find people that we can, this is why drug stigma needs to be challenged, yes. is because it's important for me anyway to have uh, a couple people in my life that I can talk to about partying and talk to about how it's going and how often I'm doing it or how like infrequently I'm doing it, what I'm getting out of it, how it's making me feel. Mm -hmm. Am I getting what I want? Am I getting what I need? Um, and uh, you know, like I love the ability to be able to um, build meaningful relationships and have like deep intimate connections to people um, in a, in a really quick way. Like, that's a really amazing benefit. Yes. And then there, oh. there feels like some of these connections um, have actually lasted for, like, for years. And I'm super thankful for the kinds of relationships I've been able to build through partying. Um, that said, if I haven't eaten or I haven't slept for a couple of mm -hmm. days, um, my goals uh, are maybe not going to be met in the same way. Yes. You know? So it's also thinking about, like, these are some things that I want, and am I gonna? I'm doing a little reality testing, or thinking like, have I have I had a lot of luck in the past <laughs> of partying past three days and feeling good about it? But and also when you start like, or six days, or, 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 or yeah, like I've done five days, and that I'm not, I'll never do that again. But one thing that I often will do is 
if I'm not, if I'm in the mood that I'm not having a good time and things are starting to slow down a bit, I will um, say to the people, I will try and say to the people to, you have two hours or you have an hour or an hour and a half to get your stuff ready as I'm going to be shutting things down now yeah. because I need to sleep. Um, I, and I think sleep is the most important because if you're not, if you don't have enough rest, you cannot perform very well. Yeah. And that's one thing that I have noticed big time in my party. In, but I always want to party. That's the problem. Sometimes <laughs> I always want to keep going, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't do it. Because I, I know my body is telling me, no. So what about when the party's over? Party, look, for me, party's over, I'll clean up the house, and then I will roll myself a nice J, and I will put Netflix on. Mm -hmm. And just watch. So you have like a strategy, like this yeah. is the thing that works for you. Yeah, this is the thing that works for me. Awesome. You know? And that's so it, and it works most of the time. It does work, but there are times mm -hmm. where I've had mm -hmm. days where I, it took me like it, you know, took me all night to get to work, like to get to uh, sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like um, uh, with like with stimulants, um, you know, sometimes having like uh, an Ativan or Lorazepam can be really useful if I need to like have it. You know, if people have access to or maybe prescriptions to those things or to sleeping pills that can be really useful for folks if they are just going to be wired and awake for a long time. Also, um, similarly, like I want to make sure that I am taking some sort of caloric intake. I need to get some food in me, yes. but the ongoing joke is when I've got any stimulant in my body, uh, it's just, oh, I'm off food these days, you know, just, I'm off food. Uh, so having things like uh, protein drinks, um, like uh, yogurt drinks, um, Basically, any like anything that is liquid that I don't have to chew that is bulked up more than a juice uh, is a great strategy. Um, some folks uh, tend to gorge on candy. I find that like the that amount of like citric acid ends up um, making my um, uh, teeth and gums end up feeling super weird. I feel like it ends up getting me like more prone to like um, canker sores. Uh, but some of my friends swear by just having like candy stashed all over the place. Um, but I always have like um, soft, squishy foods available for me for the coming out. It's like I want, I just want soft, squishy feelings. Put on Golden Girls Marathon. Have like lots of blankets and pillows. Food that, that basically that's like collapses idea. to the touch. That's a very, very good idea. Oh, yeah. I didn't have to try that. So then Dorothy says cut, and then Rose says only the director can say cut. <laughs> Blanche yells cut twice more. Do we have to do this for like the sound? One, two, three. <laughs> um, anyway, so squishy foods, golden girls, multiple pillows. Um, put my uh, put my phone on um, airplane mode and disconnect the like disconnect messenger from my um, thing, mm -hmm. and so that I'm like so that I can still like oh I want to check my email great or I want to like. Go on Facebook or something, but I, I but I'm just, like I'm intentionally kind of making myself a little bit less um, available, um, so that I can focus just on what so I can be a little bit more aware of what are the things that my body wants instead of you know all that open effort telling me I want more thing more thing more thing. Um, we were talking about um, come down strategies for like the apres ski. I. I have a question on that. It, but what I do, what I try to do is I actually give, if I'm feeling that it's not going, it's slowing down and people are starting to get tired and things like that, I will tell people, I will give them an actual time when I'd like people to start getting ready and to, leave, and to start going. Yeah. So this way that I have, um, I have my space also. Yeah, 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 I think that's actually super important and helpful. It's just to be like, I, um, this is great, and this is about how much time I have left. I will usually say that, like, I tend to go with, like, a half an hour. Like, I got about another half an hour in me, and then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. And I often, what I often do, too, is I often tell, you know, I often let people go, come in, uh, come in and go out when they want yeah, so that's and I think that is one of the best ways that I've actually done, um, keeping people safe. And I, and if I see something too high, and if they they are driving, I will 
try my best to make sure that they do not leave the apartment. Yeah. Well, that I think is a great strategy too. Is like what happens when you're trying to end the night, and there's or like or someone has too much and is not doing good. Um, like, how do we take care of each other? Like, what happens if there is like an overdose? What happens if there is uh, uh, EMT is required, which means the the police are going to come yeah. ahead. Um, so thinking about strategies for um, how do I clean all of my, you know, like how do I clean my space of drug paraphernalia so that I can have the police in here if they need to be? Because I don't want the police in my house, I do, I but never I, I never did want to be accountable to people who are maybe having a health crisis. So I need to figure out how to manage those things, you know. So having some strategies, um, having like a neighbor maybe that you could bring in, um, or like bring a person to a neighbor's house. Um, thinking about like having uh, subway maps and maybe token or like streetcar or um, bus routes, cab company numbers, having a couple of extra bucks or some like uh, like enough change for uh, the bus just kind of available and in like the stand by the or like by your keys so that if folks are in like a hard way but you can't kind of keep them in your space you at least are providing something for them to get to the next location. And that is a very good way, and I and I don't often think of that too myself. Well, mind you, I don't have the funds either to to supply. I mean, it's not everybody's exactly within everyone's wheelhouse or availability. That's it, and so you you know I do the best that I can, but I also try to make sure that my part when I have a party at home, but I also limit my party you know, too to maximum of four four or five people, mm -hmm. because I found I I had a party where. Uh, and it wasn't here, it was in Toronto, where I had seven people in my apartment in a, one, in a studio. And it started really getting out of control. Yeah. And that's when I said, no, that's it, I will not ever have it. So I have a maximum of five people in my house. Yeah. And that way really it keeps me safe and it keeps them safe too. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a, a you know, little event with eight people in my small in one room in my small house and a small apartment and um, yeah it was like playing Jenga yeah yeah and just like after a certain point it's not you know it's, it's not like you're not, you're not actually having fun anymore no you're actually having you're actually ending up aggravated you're ending up mad and mm -hmm. you're ending up in where you don't want to be yeah and I think that's maybe a great thing for us to kind of um, ruminate on as a closing point is just kind of to remind us and remind everyone that's watching um, that this is all about um, enjoying ourselves. Yeah. It's about having fun and checking in with ourselves about um, is you know like is this the fun that we are wanting to have? How do we do it in ways that make us feel good? Um, and how do we kind of keep ourselves safe and safer in it? And look after each other and look after ourselves. Yeah, I and I have a, I have a, a neighbor that I've actually helped out myself. Um, she does other things. Uh, I've actually helped her out, um, supplied her with some some kits and things like that. Well, that's awesome. And she actually comes to me and talks to me about things, and we talk together, and I make sure that she, it, I know, like, she's been partying this uh, past week, and I and I gave her, I had extra, a little bit of extra food that somebody gave me, so I gave her the extra food. So it was, keeping people safe is the most important thing. Yeah. And I think that is the ultimate, and that's when your party, seem, your party is a good success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you don't have any arguments, you don't have any fights, and you don't have the cops or the EMS at your door. Yeah. Don't be an arsehole and give me a kiss. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for uh, yes. tuning in, and thanks to Max Ottawa for um, bringing us here to have this uh, conversation. Um, and thanks to you, David. Well, thank you, uh, and thanks to you too. I've learned a lot also today, so. Yeah, this is fun. This is, what, this is what talking and being open is about. This is how you learn things in life, and that's what I take away in my life, is I'm open to people, I'm open to talking, and I taught a lot of people a lot of things in my life, and I'm happy to say it. Absolutely. It's all just power. It is power. There's so much power. Get your life. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does.